So I would say that when I was young, um, my father impressed upon me that you shouldn't or no one should interfere with somebody's ability to support themselves, support their family, put food on the table. I must have been 12 or 13 when he said that. 30 some odd years later, it has uh, stuck with me and it's something that resonates with me, um, particularly since half of my work is on behalf of employees in employment discrimination cases. Because at the end of the day, we are all just employees trying to work for a living, support ourselves, support our family. So that's what uh, drives me in that regard. When I was a young father, our second daughter had some breathing issues. And we went, on day 11 of life, she had to go back into the hospital for about a month. She was having apneic episodes, basically stopped breathing for brief periods of time. And we ended up at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which is an extraordinary facility with some of the best pediatric physicians in the world. And you realize when you get in the hands of somebody that is good at what they do, that how important that is. And so one of the things I like about it is being good at what I do in order to help people that need it, just like my wife and I did. And by the time a case gets to us, it's fairly significant. And while not an imminent threat of life or death, like in my situation, these people's lives to some extent hang in the balance, particularly in the employment cases. And they need to know that they're in good hands. So it's like when you go to the doctor, you want the doctor to say, okay, here's what's wrong. Here's how we're gonna make you better. Everything's gonna be fine. And you leave feeling good about the situation. I think that's what I like the most. The how is, it just happened. When I started working here 18 years ago, one of the cases I worked on was a police employment case. And then there was another one, and then there was another one, and then there was another one. And after about seven or eight years of doing them, I was approached by the Los Angeles Police Protective League and asked if I would allow myself to be listed on their panel council. So when you're a member of a union, they want the union to be the one-stop shop. So that's why when you're the member of a union, they normally find a car dealership that gives you discounts and the real estate agent that'll give you the discount because they want it to be a benefit. So the first time I said no. So I kept representing people and people and then I met with them again and they convinced me to do it. So that's the how. Anytime law enforcement is in the news, for whatever reason, causes people to think about law enforcement and then think about how law enforcement is run. Well, my cases in the employment realm challenge how law enforcement is run. So when you do a civil rights case and if you do a shooting case, it's a wrongful death case, the focus is really on that incident. Did the shooting officer have an objectively reasonable fear of serious imminent harm to him or herself or others? That's the whole inquiry. But when you put an employment case on, you're examining oftentimes years of interaction and memos and emails which get into the inner workings of how a police department is and is not run. And when you get to a higher level of media scrutiny, and particularly with or in the post-Ferguson era, a lot of the scrutiny is not just on the event that's shown in the street, it's how did it get there? How was the department run to allow that to happen? It's the same thing that I'm examining, but from a different perspective. And so people, which become prospective jurors, will then have either entrenched views or shifted views. But it will be something they will have thought about, whereas if it were not in the media, they would not.